Good morning. Okay, that was better. Okay, um, my name is Ashley Mosley. I am Pastor Brian's wife. I am the mama to Garrison Brody and Warner, and you did not see us last week because we kept the stomach flu at home last week. So we know that illness is going around, and we're so excited that all of you healthy people are here today. Um, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share the final message in XO. February is almost over. <sighs> How did that happen? If you're watching by YouTube, thank you for tuning in with us today. We are so grateful that you are watching from wherever you are. Maybe you are at home with the stomach flu, too. We are praying for you. Um, that is no fun. And um, today, we are going to go, and we're going to go straight to Romans 12. So if you have your Bible, go there. If you have it on your phone, go there. If you don't, it's okay. It's on the screen. Um, but Romans 12, 2, let's jump right in. This is the, the scripture, the verse that we have been using for the XO series. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Lord, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for this beautiful sunny Sunday in February. I thank you for the city of Las Vegas. Lord, I thank you for the Springs Church and this family that you have given us here in this city. And Lord, I ask that your words will be my words today. Lord, that you will speak right through me, that I am just a messenger, a vessel carrying your message to your people whom you love so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, guys, this verse that I read, I love so much um, because I feel like it is incredibly freeing. We have the world that's telling us that we should live a certain way. But this verse that we find in the Bible, God's truth, tells us that we should not be conforming to the patterns of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through this right here. So when I feel the pressures of the world, especially the pressures of the world on my relationships, and it doesn't look like what this says, I go by what this says. I don't go by Hollywood. I don't go by my flesh because my flesh is of the world especially when it comes to relationships. And today when I say relationships, and I know we're in the month of February and this thing is called XO, but it doesn't just mean like your love relationships. This is your relationships across the board. This is your relationships in your family, your work relationships, your church family relationships, um, your, uh, I said work relationships, school relationships, any kind of relationships today, I just want you to kind of be in that, that frame of mind that I'm not just talking about love relationships. So we are going to look and see how the Bible tells us to be set apart from the world in our relationships. And today we're talking about relationships and when they don't go exactly like we would like. Okay, so I'm a very relational person. If you've been around here for a hot minute... Um, I call myself the Category 5 hurricane to the Mosley calm. Like if you've met Brian and his parents, they're calm. They're steady. And then I entered into the family. Um, and I just, I love, I love relationships. Now, don't get me wrong. I like my time alone. I like, I like my time alone. But I love my time with people. Um, as a matter of fact, when Brian and I go and travel, we love to travel and we love to go in the off peak season, but I do not want to go and travel somewhere where there is not going to be any people at all. Um, like I'm thinking of that Chevy Chase movie where they go to Wally World and there is no one there. Like it's a ghost town. What was that movie called? Vacation. Vacation? Okay, good. I'm doing great today. Um, <laughs> And they arrive to Wally World, and no one is there. I don't want to go on vacation like that. I also don't want to go to Disneyland on the day of on Christmas Day. I don't want that many people. But I'm just I'm, my point is, I love being around people. I love my relationship, my marriage with Brian. I love spending time with him. I love, I will go and sit on a rock while he's fishing, like as long as we're together. I'm talking, and he likes me to stop talking. <laughs> sometimes. Um, and just, you know, he like, he does love quiet. Um, and he married me. I don't know the irony. Um, 
I love my, I love, I love you all. I love our church family and the, who the Lord has given us here in Vegas. I love even hanging out with my crazy boys. Um, I love my in-laws. Brian said, you know, we had arguments in the past, you know, and sometimes concerning in-laws where you guys came. I was like, no, no, I love my in-laws. It's, today's my father-in-law's birthday, so make sure you tell him happy birthday before, um, wave at them, Steve, so everybody knows. No, y'all, like, Steve, wave, yes. He's 29 again today. Um, but even though I love relationships I'm, and I want to add value to others, I want people to add value to me too. That's what my flesh wants, and it doesn't always work that way. Um, believe it or not, when I was a little girl, I was actually incredibly shy. Like, like my best friend in elementary school, I was so shy that I spent the night at her house a ton, and I was still terrified of her dad, who was the nicest man on the face of the planet, um, like five years into my friendship with, with Carrie. Um, when I got to middle school, I was terrified. Middle school is like a horrible place anyway. Um, and I was terrified, super shy, completely misunderstood, and just became socially awkward. I was rejected. I was made fun of. Um, it hurt. And I was just a person that just wanted relationship and wanted to belong and wanted friends. And people hurt. Um, and then fast forward a little bit, Brian and I are married, we have a young family, I'm a young mom, I'm a, a full-time working mom, Brian is on staff at our home church in Tennessee, and I felt alone, like people didn't know who I was, I was okay with that, I was trying to survive and keep my head above water with all the things that were on my plate, but I longed for relationship, and I was trying to figure out how to be a mom. I was trying to figure out how to balance being a mom and working. I was trying to figure out how to be a mom and working and being married to Brian, because that's a tough one, and um, <laughs> it's so tough. It's so tough, um, and I went on this, this retreat thing. It was like a three-day um, retreat, and at the end of this retreat, and it was for women, um, they encouraged you to get into like a life group kind of thing. And this group of girls from our church that I just had admired from afar, and they just were just, they had kids older than me, and they just really seemed to all have it together. They invited me into this group. It was called a reunion group. I was so excited, but I was also terrified. Like they are not, like I'm a mess. I am a socially awkward mess, and my life is just a mess. And those women of God invited me in to this life group, this small group, because we all just, they just wanted to grow closer to the Lord together. And they saw me and they invited me in. And I remember coming home from the first time we met, it was at P.F. Chang's. Anybody love Chinese food? Okay, like, yes. Um, Pastor Brian loves any kind of Asian food, by the way. Um, and I came home on cloud nine that these women would sit and chat and just be themselves with somebody like little old me. And as time went on, I had a really hard time. Like I went through, I was in quite the season. And I thought, they are going to be so tired of my mess. They're going to be so tired of hearing my prayer request again. And I don't feel as confident as they are. And I don't really know what I'm doing in life. And they loved me anyway. They saw me through miscarriages. They saw me through kids. I saw some of them through miscarriages. And I saw them raising older kids than me. And like, okay, they're surviving. And one of those girls is actually here today. My friend Jennifer is sitting on the front row. And this was not even, like, I knew she was coming sometime in February. But she flew out last night just to encourage and to love on us. She came a year after we planted the church, and she, when we pulled up here last night, she's like, look at this, because the last time she was here, we were at the high school. 
And Jennifer and I, just in our friendship, we can go months without talking to each other. These are the kind of friendships you want. The kind where you can go months without talking to each other, and then you pick up the phone when you have a moment. And even if it's like, hi, I've got five minutes, and I'm like driving from here to there because our life is crazy. And you just pick up where you left off. But those kind of relationships and those kind of friendships do not happen overnight. They happen through times of pain and struggle. They happen through times of you messing up and them messing up. Friendships, godly friendships, relationships of any kind take a lot of time. There's only one me. There's only one you. Thank goodness there's only one of each of us. I know the world could not handle another Ashley Mosley. But when we think about, when we take billions of people and we put them on one earth, we take millions or thousands of people and we put them in one city, you take hundreds of people and you put them in one church, you take a handful of people and you put them in one family or one life group, you take two people and you put them in one relationship, you are going to have people problems. And in order to have a relationship, you have to have at least two people. Fact. And two people, I love my husband, and we could not be any more different. And he's told you guys, we argue. We do not have this picture-perfect fairy book, Hollywood, made-for-Hollywood marriage at all. No one does, by the way. But we work things through. And today I want to look at the word, and I want us to see that even Jesus himself had people problems. So get your Bible, follow along with me today, because we're going to look at, we're going to zero in on Jesus' relationship with his disciple Peter. This is really cool because we're going to be bouncing all around in the Gospels. But from the relationship of Jesus and Peter, we are reaffirmed that people will disappoint. Think about the miracle of Jesus walking on water. Side note. Get in your word. That Bible is so full of just exciting. Like, it's exciting. The Bible is not boring. Get in the word. It is just, ugh. Ah, so here's why it's exciting. So Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, um, he sends the disciples out on a boat on the water. And the water is rough, like the wind was blowing against them. So the water is rough, and the disciples are on the boat. And Peter looks out, and he sees somebody walking on water. If that's not exciting, I don't know what is, because I certainly cannot do it. So he sees someone walking on water, and they're like, oh, is it a ghost? And Peter is zeroing in, and he's like, no, it's the Lord. Jesus is walking on water. And Peter's like, yeah, Jesus, call me out. Call me out. I want to come out there to you. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's my boy, Peter. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. So he says, come on, Peter. And Peter steps out of the boat, and he's got his eyes on Jesus. Like, this is a good relationship right here. Like, they are buds. Jesus is his Lord. Zeroing in. And then Peter, his circumstances take over. Peter's humanity steps into play. And he begins to look at these waves around him and feel the wind. And he takes his eyes off of his man Jesus. And he begins to focus on his circumstances. And he sinks. And Jesus gets him. He rescues him. He's not going to be like, oh, jeez. Okay. And then Jesus says in verse 31, why did you doubt me? I'm sure when, when Peter was like, Jesus, call me out. Jesus, like my homeboy, he wants to come out here with me. Yes, he's got great faith. And then when Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus, he begins to doubt and he disappoints Jesus. Have you ever disappointed anyone? Or has anyone ever disappointed you? I'm going to say the answer is yes. We're also reaffirmed by their relationship that people make mistakes. Two chapters later in the book of Matthew, in chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's telling them about his impending death. 
Well, Peter doesn't like this discussion, so he rebukes Jesus and says, no, no, Lord, you should not be talking about that. Absolutely not. And Jesus rebukes Peter back. It's kind of like they're getting in an argument here. He rebukes Peter back, and he says, you only care about the things of earth. I have my mind on the things of heaven. And then, guys, Jesus calls Peter Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. If Jesus calls me Satan, that is not where I want to be. Peter made a mistake. He meant well, I'm sure, but he made a mistake by rebuking the Lord because Peter was only thinking earthbound. He wasn't thinking big picture. He definitely wasn't thinking like the Lord was thinking. Have you ever made mistakes in your life? Have you ever made mistakes in your relationship? Have people that you have been in relationship with ever made mistakes? I'm going to go with the answer is yes. We're also reaffirmed by Peter and Jesus that people are selfish. Looking at Mark 14, we see that Jesus knows that he's going to be arrested soon. He knows that his death is soon coming. And he is overcome with grief and sorrow. Now, he had 12 disciples, and he asked three of them to go with him to keep watch. This means he wanted them to go with him and to stay awake and to pray. Because he said, I'm overwhelmed. Now, that should be an honor for the three, because he has 12. And he's like, I need you three to come with me. And he's clearly disturbed. He's clearly not in a, yay, like life is great right now kind of mode. And it's, it's at night, and they go. And Jesus says, stay here and keep watching. I'm going to go, and I'm going to pray. So Jesus goes and prays, and he comes back. And Peter is one of those three, and he's having a snooze fest. He is not awake. He's not keeping watch. He is not praying. He's snoozing. Jesus goes and he prays and he comes back a second time, snooze fest city again. He goes and he prays and he comes back a third time. What are they doing? They're sleeping again. And Jesus has said to Peter, Peter, this is in verse 37, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Guys, people are selfish. Have you ever been selfish in your relationships? Have the people in your relationships ever been selfish? I'm going to think that the answer is yes. We got some elbows flying today. I love you guys so much. And we're also reaffirmed by the relationship of Peter and Jesus that people might betray Jesus had said to Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter's like, no, 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 Lord, no. Well, Jesus is arrested, and it's not pretty when he's arrested. And his disciples, people were zeroing in on them. And Jesus, or Peter is all like, mm. his flesh took over, guys. And three times, Peter, the one, Jesus loved him. He poured into him. He had called him. He had said, leave everything, come and follow me. Jesus had invested into Peter. Jesus had not given up on Peter. Jesus had taught and spent time with Peter. And Peter betrayed him. He denied him. Mark 14, 71 says, he began to call down curses, talking about Peter. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Oh, the heartbreak of Jesus to know that his buddy, who he'd called to walk on water, who he'd spent so much time with, had denied him and betrayed him. Have you ever been betrayed in a relationship? Have you ever been the betrayer in a relationship? 
It's undoubtedly that we see in the Gospels that there are people problems. You and I know that for a fact in 2020. Because every person in this room, if we say, no, no, we have no people problems. Life is great and grand. We know that somebody is not telling the truth. And then that's another sermon for another day. But what is incredibly amazing to me is looking back at Romans 12 too, how we should not conform to the patterns of this world. Because when we have somebody in our life like that, that betrays us, gives up on us, is selfish, doesn't believe us, doubts us, eventually we're going to be like, I'm done with you. But Jesus did not do that. And he is our prime example. So we are going to transform our mind, renew our mind by the power of the word. So let's see what Jesus did. So he didn't wash his hands clean of Peter. He could have. Jesus was fully God and fully human. He had the human stuff going on. I'm sure he's like, come on, Peter, again? But he didn't say, I'm done with you, Peter. You're getting on my nerves. Maybe he thought it, but he didn't say it. It's not written in the word. Jesus actually, we will see that he actually tells Peter in the midst of all of this, that Peter is a vital part of building his church. Look at Matthew 16, 18 with me. This is Jesus speaking. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So no matter all the junk that Peter had done, no matter how many times Peter had neglected Jesus, challenged Jesus, had disappointed Jesus, betrayed Jesus, because Jesus knows everything, he knows all of this is going to happen, he still says to Peter, I see the person in you, Peter. I see the potential in you, Peter. I see the positive in you, Peter. And I see that you growing is a process, that you haven't just arrived just because you're my disciple and you're following me. You are still a human. Jesus still saw Peter's purpose. He still saw his plan. He still believed in Peter. And he commanded him to do something incredibly important. Let's look at John 21. Verse 17, it says, a third time he asked him, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Okay, I don't know why Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Maybe it was because Jesus, or Peter had denied him three times. Maybe it's because Jesus really wants to prove his point with Peter right, right here. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. You know everything. You know that I love you. Remember, Peter, Mr. Mess Up, has messed up so many times. And Jesus says to him, if you really love me, then feed my sheep. The sheep is referring to the believers, the body of Christ. If Jesus knew that he's going to die on the cross to forgive the sins of of generations and generations and generations of all mankind. With all of the mess ups and the sin that we all have. And he knew he was going to be going to the cross and he was going to be a sacrifice for us. And he said to Peter, if you love me, Peter, then I'm, I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to serve my people. I need the abundance of the love that you have for me to overflow into your serving and feed my sheep. What an incredible call for somebody who had messed up with Jesus so many times. Guys, 
You and I are all Peter. We have messed up, and we have messed up, and we have messed up, and we're going to mess up again tomorrow. But Jesus doesn't say, I'm done with you. Will you ever learn your lesson? He says, no, I know there's a process. I know you're growing. You were once an infant in your Christianity, and then you became a toddler, and then you're going through adolescence and rejecting me again. I've got an adolescent right now. I'm... And then you're going to grow, and you're going to grow, and you're going to grow in your wisdom. And he's saying to all of you, like he said to Peter, feed my sheep. If you love me, let it well up inside of you to where it's an outward expression. And you're taking care of one another. And you're taking care of my flock. So every single day, you and I have a daily choice to be a godly influence. We have a daily choice to go to Romans 12 too, and decide that we cannot conform to the patterns of this world. That when somebody cuts us off while we're driving on the 95, that we can't just give them the royal bird. That we're called to be set apart and we're called to be different. When you have that rough relationship at work, you're called to be set apart and you're called to be different. When you're arguing with your spouse or you're having difficulty at home, you're called to be set apart and called to be different. So we can learn from Jesus and his relationship with Peter and what exactly he did, he did do. I want you to remember this. Your influence is not determined by your level of success. Your influence is determined by your ability to help others succeed. How can you add value to others? Five things. If you're taking notes today, you can write these down. The first one I want to share is focus on the person. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Don't be selfish. I just love the Bible. <laughs> just so cut and dry. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an egocentric society. Me, 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 me. How can I climb the corporate ladder? Who do I have to blaze a trail over to get to where I want to go? If you're not meeting my needs, I'm sorry, you're not meeting my needs. And we see this all around us in the world. And our flesh wants to go there because our flesh wants to take care of ourselves. But be, don't, don't be like the world. Don't conform to the world's ways. But conform to the ways of the Bible. I want to challenge you today to think of others in your marriage, at work, with your children, when you're checking out at Smith's with the grocery store clerk. Think of others. What are they, where are they at? Where are they going through? In your relationships, can you turn your focus on the other person and not on how is this relationship benefiting me? Number two, focus on the positive. Ephesians 4.32 says, instead, be kind to each other. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Have you ever noticed that in this day and age, we get to review everything? Facebook review, Yelp review, Google review, 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 review. And people love to review when they are mad. People love to review when something negative has happened. At the store, at Target, people are not in the customer service line to say, you know what, Sally was an excellent cashier today. She really loves her job, and she did it with just uber excellence. Uh-uh, you're in Target, and you know that somebody's mad at the pharmacist when they're standing at the customer service line, and they've got their head moving, and they say, I'm about to call corporate. There is nothing wrong if you were not treated fairly with standing up for yourself in a kind, God-given way. But there's nothing wrong 
for also taking a few moments to say, you're doing your job really well and I want to let your manager know. There's nothing wrong with highlighting the positive in the people in your relationship instead of just hounding on the negative when they don't do the things that you want. There is nothing wrong with saying, babe, thank you so much for providing for our family instead of hounding on, I cannot believe you didn't take the trash out again. We're so in our flesh, we're so good with just like pounding out the negative. But can we shift and can we focus on the positive? Imagine what would happen if we all did that. It'd be incredible. If we all could just focus on the positive, people would start living better. People would start being better. Number three, focus on their potential. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. That's 1 Peter 4.10. Each and every one of you has a gift. Each and every one of you has potential. And this is what I really love about our pastor. Is Pastor V, he does not mind listening to people say, I have a calling on my life. I feel like I'm supposed to share the word of God. I've prayed over this. He he begins to meet with people. Taz Seda, um, John Hosey. Ashley Mosley, and he begins to coach us and talk with us, see where we are with the Lord, and then he doesn't mind saying, okay, now I love my flock, because he loves you all, and he's not just going to put anybody up here to share the word of God with you, because his job as a shepherd is to take care of you and protect you, but when people say, I feel like I have a call on my life, and it's a call for speaking, he doesn't mind coaching them and walking them through that. Um, I know that the Kairos group came last summer, and a young man got to stand. I cannot think of his name right now, but he got to stand up here, and he got to share the word. He was a co- Daniel. He was a college student. Um, it is terrifying to stand up here. I know you guys are in the zone, like you're in the zone, but there's not a lot of smiles that come to us up here, like you're in the zone, like, Okay, uh oh, he's snoozing over there. I better turn it up, kind of thing. It is terrifying. There's lots of eyes on me right now. And Brian knows how terrifying it is. The very first time that he stood in a pulpit, he froze. He was in college. I was with him. It was a tiny little church, and there might have been like five people in that congregation on that Wednesday night. And he froze in fear. But that pastor gave Brian Mosley a chance. You cannot step into your call if you do not have somebody seeing your potential and giving you a chance. Now, Brian is never going to give me the chance to sing because he knows my abilities. He knows my abilities, and that's where he's like, I'm using wisdom, and everybody will leave the church, Ashley, if you get up there and sing. So he is a wise pastor. But can we see... And highlight the potential in people. The world will browbeat us. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. But as Christians, can we see people's potential and speak to their potential and encouraging them in their potential? Because their potential is part of their purpose. That's number four. Focus on their purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Pastor Rory said it today. If you've been around here for a hot minute, you know that I say it all the time. Every single person in here, your purpose is not just to suck air and to keep a seat warm. You have a purpose and a plan on your life. God knew your purpose and your plan far before you were ever knit together in your mother's womb. You have a purpose, a God-given destiny. And we have a world that's telling us it's dog-eat-dog, and if you're not good enough, you cannot be in this place, in this position. But as believers, as Christ followers, can we speak into the purpose of our brothers and our sisters? Can we continue? Can we say, you know what? You are an excellent singer, and I, I just, have you ever considered singing on the worship team? Oh, no, my nerves. I, I could never do that. 
you continuously speak into their purpose. God has given you a gift, a vocal gift. Can you stand up there and get beyond yourself for fear of all eyes on you? Because their eyes aren't supposed to be on you anyway. Their eyes are supposed to be on the Lord. Can you, like, and an encouraging, encouraging, encouraging. You are excellent working with children. I know you think they're ankle biters, but they're not. You're so good with them. You love missions work. Like the things you love are indicators of the purpose that the Lord has given you. You love missions work. You don't think that you can raise the money for it. You don't think that you can do that. You're too afraid. We have a group of girls in the back here that are with YWAM. And they're headed to Mexico tomorrow to do missions work, which is absolutely incredible. (laughs) That is terrifying. But somebody spoke into their purpose at some point in time. As believers, can we speak into the purpose of our brothers and our sisters? Encourage them in their call. Because I have said this 400 times at least, and I know there are people still in this room that do not believe that. And that's okay. I will say it 401 times. And I'm asking my brothers and sisters in Christ to be speaking of the purpose of your brothers and sisters sitting next to you. Because somebody needs to keep hearing it. Because growing in Christ is a process, and that's number five. I want you to focus on the process of the people that you are in relationship with. As you work others and help them succeed, ask, what are your next steps? What are your next steps? Do you know the Lord? That's the first and most essential step. Do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus, I want to introduce you to him because he will change your life. Getting water baptized, joining a life group, attending the growth track, developing the habit of of prayer and Bible reading, sharing your faith with others, becoming a giver. And when I say becoming a giver, I'm not just talking about money. Ah, there it is. Church is talking about money again. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your time, your talent, and your treasure. Luke 6, 38 says, give and you will receive time, talent, and treasure. Your gift will return to you in full. As Pastor Rory said earlier, use the same scripture, press down, shake it together to make room for more. Running over and pour it into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. We have to remember with people in our lives, their life is a process. When I asked Jesus into my heart, I did not just arrive. It was not like running through a field of daisies and there were unicorns and just like glitter was falling down. No, I had, I had accepted my Lord and my Savior, and yes, my life was changed, but I had a lot of growing to do. I had to move from being bottle-fed the Bible to cutting that steak up and feeding myself from the Bible. It's a process. And so when you have relationships with people, especially other believers, and you are sick and tired, like why can't they just grow up? You have to remember that it's a process. When your spouse is not doing what you want them to do, A, check yourself. And B, remember it's all a process. And can we patiently love the person and see their purpose and see their potential? And see the positive in them and be focusing on that. Because the Lord did not say, I, these dusty, ratty people that are full of sin, I cannot use them. He didn't say that. He said, "Woo! I can use every single one of them for my glory. I love on Facebook seeing people I went to high school with that lived like hell in high school. And right now, in their late 30s, they are celebrating Jesus. I love that because I'm like, that is life change. I would have never guessed that that person would be praising Jesus all over Facebook in 2020. And that is incredible. And I believe our Lord says, I'm going to take your filth and I'm going to take your rags and I'm going to make something amazing about it. And we as his children, we need to see that in every single one of our brothers and sisters. Your neighbor that gets on your nerves may not know Jesus. And it is a process. And you have to love them. You have to see the person and the positive and the potential in them. 
You have to see that they have a call on their life. They don't know it yet. And you love them anyway. Because we have the greatest example in Jesus. How he loved the filth and the mire of Peter. And he loves the filth and the mire of Ashley Mosley. And he says, I'm going to do something great through that girl. Because people are going to see me through her.